Live here, this is SiliconAngle.com, uh, exclusive coverage of OpenStack Summit. I'm John Furrier, joined with my co-host, Jeff Frick, uh, here with the CTO of Service Mesh, Sean Douglas. Welcome back to theCUBE. Yeah, thank Great you very to have much, you. good to see you. Good to see <laughs> you. Yeah, for the alumni, we like having alumni. <laughs> so, uh, I'm on a different team now though, so it's good to be back. Thanks so obviously me. OpenStack is going mainstream. Um, we talked earlier segments about how uh, awesome it is to see something grow open source wise the way it did organically. And now a lot of the big companies are coming on board. Um, we're now a couple of years into the cloud wars, hypervisor conversations now evolved and OpenStack has now won that conversation. Um, how do you describe the current state of the market? Um, you were previously at EMC Ventures, so you're pretty active in the cloud space, right. what's going on, you know, at the infrastructure level, because there's a lot of things going on around people building clouds. Uh, what's your take on the current situation with the cloud? Well, I mean, so if you start first with the OpenStack space, I think it's really interesting times. So if you look, there's been, you know, it really started out with just a few players. Now we've had fragmentation into all these different distributions, if you will, of OpenStack and uh, getting major endorsement and support from IBM just like they did with Linux. And uh, I think you're seeing you know, the competitive hackles come up from VMware in the market where they really recognize that OpenStack is a potential competitive threat to their domination really of the enterprise um, hypervisor and, and private cloud management market. And I think that every day we're seeing more and more people embrace OpenStack. And I mean, we're big supporters. We, uh, sorry here, we manage both um, private cloud OpenStack solutions and can deploy uh, OpenStack as well as we deploy to um, public cloud OpenStack solutions. Um, you know, pretty much the reason I'm, I'm here is I'm working with every one of the major uh, distributions, flavors of OpenStacks, and we want to you know, work with the best of breed and provide enterprises with a, with a solution that uh, you know, meets their needs and requirements and partnering with them is a key enabler because we're uh, we're basically enabling the orchestration and management of all the OpenStack players. So talk about Service Mesh. I mean, you guys um, are a company that's out there doing a lot of good work here. What does the company do? Just okay. describe, describe to the folks what Service Mesh is all about. Yeah, certainly. So uh, Service Mesh is a, a cloud management platform for enterprises that are trying to transform their businesses to embrace a cloud operating model. We're really focused on you know, the, the Enterprise 2000, if you will, and we've built the business over the past four years. I'm new to the team, but I've, I've been a huge fan prior to joining, but we've built the business over the past four years focused on highly regulated uh, industries such as financial services, healthcare, where you need to have enterprise expertise and security and, and uh, management capabilities that today have not, up to this point, have not really been available in cloud platforms, so we're enabling enterprises to really go after a hybrid cloud solution. So we, we enable management across any of the 16 public, public cloud providers, as well as the management of private cloud, whether that be on VMware, whether that be on Hyper-V, or on OpenStack, and we can, via a single built-for-purpose platform, we can manage the deployment of your blueprint that's cloud agnostic across any of the public clouds or any of the private clouds, all in context of your enterprise security and governance position and posture. And that's a huge game changer for a CIO because a lot of these CIOs, they recognize that they are going up and they're, they're having to compete with the uh, shadow IT, if you will, where people have started to use AWS in, in their enterprise and start to consume those resources and, and they get used to, well, why is why has IT been an impediment for me when my developers are going out and grabbing these resources and spinning these up? But then they realize that, hey, I've got this whole compliance and governance and security issue where I've got people run amok, right? So what Service Mesh enables is you to take that problem and turn it into an opportunity and, and you can actually manage your deployment into public clouds in context of your governance and security compliance posture of an enterprise. So because we built our, our business in those environments, we're, we're just at a, a, an amazing advantage over other players today. I'm not trying to just give you the pitch, but um, <laughs> over players well, today. But you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you are. Talk about the other players. Talk about the competition then. Yeah. Who are, the, who are those other players? So uh, we, we run into BMC in you know, almost every account. Um, BMC's, their, their CLM product, is really comprised of six different products glued together, which requires about six to nine months install, about $2 million, and an army of professional services guys. 
and we have a built for a purpose package solution that has one common meta model and one policy engine that manages across all of that. So it's when we're in the account, you know, toe to toe, we win. When we when they're already in there, there's a sunken investment and it's a little bit more difficult. It's hard to throw that yeah, away. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to throw that yeah. away. Um, so, so I'll talk a little bit. It's it's interesting uh, kind of dichotomy. At one end, you've got companies that rely on IT as a competitive advantage. Right. Who really want to take advantage of, of, of all that the cloud promises to be, whether it's speed or scale or cost. At the same time, if you're if IT is your competitive advantage, you probably have all types of of uh, you know regulations and security and, and all those things. But it's it's really probably the same person, the same organizations that want to drive it. So talk a little bit about how they're making trade-off decisions and how they're prioritizing and how right. they are finding ways to go forward in kind of the innovation while at the same time dealing with the reality that that, that, they, that they've got some real restrictions and real uh, yeah. inhibitors to their ability to adopt some of this new right. stuff. So you know, I think that that's actually you know, the interesting thing today about people that are starting to embrace a cloud-based operating model because you know, the global you know, Fortune 100, for example, they should have a significant competitive advantage just on capital spend and, and war chest of, of existing infrastructure spend to be able to go out and compete with smaller, more nimble companies. But what's happening is the smaller and more nimble companies have built their businesses on cloud-based operating models and because they built their businesses on cloud-based operating models, they have this agility where these the slow, larger corporations have, IT has been an inhibitor because of their policy, their compliance, their procurement process. You know, 80% of their spend is really focused on, you know, sustaining engineering, where 20% is, is you know, growing, you know, new opportunities, where, you know, the more agile guys, it's all in on, on the more agile stuff, and what we do is we enable a CIO to adopt that cloud-based operating model by orchestration of whatever the underlying resources are, whether that be Hyper-V or VMware or OpenStack or, or deploy into AWS or Rackspace or whatever. We can do all of that in context of the application. Mm -hmm. So we do application-centric orchestration of the underlying infrastructure, and we can do that in context of the software development lifecycle. So it's it, it's really a DevOps for the enterprise story. Okay. So yes, we plug into Puppet or what have you there, but we can deploy, for example, all your developers will get you know 10 AWS instances, but when they commit their code into Git, and it gets built in Jenkins, when they deploy, maybe they deploy in our data center on a vBlock or on a you know, FlexPod or whatever, and when they move to uh, production, that'll be, they can move that around. We can follow that through the life cycle, being at the right place at the right time with the right security and, and role-based access model, which is very much an enterprise play. So you know, I think it's an inter interesting time. You and know? Are, they get, are they getting it? Are they getting it that, that the reality is out of the credit card wants to do a little project on AWS, he's right. going to do it. So rather than really kind of fight the tide, it's more, you know, how do we how do we embrace it? How do we make it part of our procedure and enable him to move from his little toy project, which was fine, yeah. into you know production and into kind of our mature and, well, and more think, regulated infrastructure. I think the CIOs fully get this problem and it, it, it's a huge challenge for them. You can imagine if you're a CIO and you know, you've got a whole business unit that's spinning up things at you know, 10, 15 grand a month on AWS and they come to you and say, hey look, programmatic API access, you know, available 24 seven, I don't need your help, and I get what I need and, and turn it off when I'm done. Right. And you're like, um, let me spin, order a machine, <laughs> let's spec it, let's, you know, they're talking about a nine month process, right. so if you can help the CIO transform their business into this cloud-based operating model across public and private, I mean, it, it's game changing for them. So what does that mean? That means instead of nine months to deploy a new application, that could be, you know, literally, if you have some type of a platform, whether it's us or somebody else, whatever, if you can spin that up on demand, in context of the application, spinning up VMs is not really strategic, right? Being able to spin up a VM and, and to do uh, workflow automation around that, okay, so I can spin up machi virtual machines faster, but every single workflow is specific to a virtual machine, and that's like, building snowflakes, so <laughs> now you want to do it at, uh, automatedly, so you've got yeah. a snowmaking machine. We were talking right? about that with Randy Bias, and I think this is, yeah. the, this is a miscon mis misconception, is that it's not about virtual machines. No, it's about applications. It's about really transforming the data center. So let's, yeah. uh, let's drill down on the CIO thing. So, so obviously CIOs have legacy, yeah. and they have a data center, yeah. and the cloud is a resource, there's economics involved. Amazon has proven yes. that this is a viable way. So they're all like, okay, I want some of that. But 
they have to fit it into their architecture. So hybrid cloud has emerged as this bridge between yeah. you know, the data center, the old data center, and the benefits of the public cloud, AKA Amazon and web right. services. How do you guys look at that and, 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 and tell us, in your opinion, expert opinion, what is this hybrid cloud okay, mm -hmm. for the enterprise? What does it really mean and what, what can enterprises do today um, that you guys have experience on that you could share? Okay, that's a lot there. Um, so uh, fundamentally I believe that private cloud or public cloud is, is where we're at in the industry today. I think where people need to go is to be able to manage effectively cloud brokers across your public cloud and your private cloud. And you want to be able to say, I want to put the right workload at the right place, at the right time, at the right cost point. And if you go with you know, just a you know, one vendor solution that only manages a private cloud and one vendor solution that only manages public cloud, by definition, you've you've locked yourself in in a cloud broker like us, or there's you know there's other players out there that provide this cloud broker function. Really enables you to have vendor contestability across. Hey, I'm going to you know, negotiate my VMware enterprise license. Hey, watch this. Click. Watch me move to Hyper V. Click. Watch me move to AWS. Move my you know rebuild my application in each of those environments. That puts the power back in the CIO's hands. Right? They're not locked into a vendor. They're, they're now realizing the value of a cloud-based operating model. That's and that's, that's, that's huge. So, so have they really gotten stoked about this. To, the, to the maturity where they can delineate projects and or enable people that need to spin up projects yeah. to allocate that project to the most appropriate cloud option? So different customers are at different stages, but if, for example, you take some of our you know, early showcase customers like UBS, like, uh, Commonwealth Bank of Australia, like Visa, some of these guys, these guys are, what they'll do is they'll, they've, uh, they, this becomes their, the architectural control point really in, uh, across their public and their private uh, clouds and, and they can do at a very fine level of granularity, well that can actually start at a, a business unit, okay, the you know, credit card processing business unit, I'm making this up, right? Um, we'll have this ability to consume, manage, deploy, scale up, scale down resources based upon who they are, where they're at in the, in the application life cycle, right? Um, but then they can, they can do lower levels of granularity, for example, and we do this and other people do this as well. Um, and you can, by, by giving this role-based access control in context of the software development or application life cycle, it's a huge edge for them because they can automate and remove manual process and steps. And if you like, we we've got our marketing guys have slides. I'm sorry, I'm the CTO, <laughs> not the marketing That's guy. That's all right. But um, no if you look at cube. that, th there's customers like you know one of the uh, I think it's Commonwealth Bank in Australia that saved hundreds of millions right. of dollars just mm -hmm. cutting out in in. Uh, additional process and infrastructure and what have you, and accelerated their business in, in time to value for applica applications. We're seeing similar things in the converged device players. People are going and buying, for example, V-Blocks or FlexPods or you know, whatever HDS's thing is, right? And they're going, hey, I love, I'm doing a data center refresh. Uh, you know, I, over the next three years, I'm going to get rid of all my servers and I'm doing I'm a standard converge on a converged device. Right, right. And they're going, well, even if I get a converged device, it's it's still three weeks to six months but to a time to value. So, you know, you get something like this on top of that where yeah. your application focus as opposed to virtual machine spinner upper. Well it's focus, almost uh, you can kick ass. The attributes of the application and those people that are executing it define which cloud which resources is right. pulled from a pool of resources. You know, you have kind of got you got cloud cloud squared, right? I have yeah. many yeah. options and based on the requirements and the cost, I may choose to deploy based on how you right. define your project on this. Pool or this pool, you don't know. It's still a cloud within a well, cloud. It's a, right? it's a developer. It. It's a developer angle, right? Yeah, so the developers right. are in charge, That's and I think great. Um, I want to drill down on the point you made about pressing the button and eliminating those licenses and moving things around on a hypervisor. Um, the developers are in charge, and, and the you, know, you 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 and I talk, priest about infrastructure yeah. as code. Right. 
What is going on about OpenStack today that makes this possible? Because that seems like a little bit of a fantasy. You just go back a couple of years, wait a minute, CIOs are in charge, um, and yeah. that's a good theme. They want to be in charge, and if, they would love to get rid of their data centers if they could. So, okay, there's some you know, new stuff happening. HP's yeah. got new servers for low energy. Okay, mm -hmm. cool, density, power, cooling. But the developer angle, how does that affect, and what is OpenStack? Why is OpenStack relevant in that context? So, I think, OpenStack is incredibly relevant in that context because effectively OpenStack has the potential and is becoming the cloud operating system, alternative to VMware's cloud operating system, right? Um, and, as a, and as a preventative against Amazon. Yeah, exactly. You know, so you know, behind the firewall you can have Amazon-like services, right? So, I mean, I think that in order to do that type of management at scale, you have to start treating your infrastructure as code. You have to embrace a DevOps model. What does that model. mean to you? So treating Describe your infrastructure as code. What does that specifically so, mean? So, I mean, look at what people have, I mean, it's, if you go back to, a, if you really roll back, you know, peel back the onion on this, people have been treating their infrastructure as code for a long time with shell scripts and with, with uh, you know, Python and Perl, and, and you know, I'm doing that 14 years ago in my career when, when I was still writing code, right? But I think that what's different is that it's all about trust. Automation is about trust, and I think we're getting to a point in the industry where people trust the automation tools to do management at scale, and instead of managing one or two or a hundred, or like, you know, when I was at LoudCloud, it was like, we were managing a thousand or two thousand virtual, I mean, uh, physical machines. That was amazing scale. Now, people manage, you know, hundreds of thousands of machines, and in order to do that, you have to automate that. In order to automate that, you have to have treat those configurations and check those configurations in so you can roll forward, roll back. And if you don't do that, you have a manager. So failure. Amazon is automating a lot. So yeah. if you look at the current state of Amazon Web Services, they are eliminating the ops and DevOps because right. the developers just code and all the ops has been automated well, away. Well, it's still DevOps, um, you're just using their ops. <laughs> 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 a developer doesn't need to be an ops guy <laughs> right, to right. run on Amazon, but that's right. a little bit you know, a unique corner case when you're just you know, in, a, in a vacuum by yourself. But if you're an enterprise, talk about um, why, that, why Amazon is feared by CIOs and, and folks. Oh, this is an amazing story, right? I mean, if you talk to the AWS guys, I've talked to them quite a few times in the past, and they have waged a long-term war on enterprise software where it's mar margin compression over time. And, they want and they're it. doing it. And they're doing it, they're killing it, right? I mean, we love AWS, we're working with them all over the place, and as well as with Rackspace, as well as with you know, the OpenStack guys for you know, the public cloud providers. I mean, it is. They're just I mean, going Amazon is a phenomenon, they're commoditizing, yeah. infrastructure and at the same time innovating. This is the <laughs> Larry Ellison uh, uh, Linux play you know, 10 years ago, right? Where he just you know, tried to just commoditize everything except for the database. Well, Amazon's like, hey, we're used to operating at 3% margins. We're going to you know, now go after this 90 plus percent margin business, right? So you know, they're at a you know, very strategic But why are, why are CIOs afraid of Amazon? Is it just, just the way they, things were done in the past? Is it the really this data security? Are there things that, that, that are uh, legit fears? Well, I think that the legitimate fears are you could go to jail if you put the wrong data there and it gets, <laughs> you know, so, something happens to that, right, right? right? I think that's a legitimate fear and I think that's why we'll have hybrid clouds. You will put what is, you know, regulated by compliance that you go to jail if it, somebody gets into it behind the firewall and you can do, non-core or adjacent or bursting functionality into public clouds or develop into public clouds and you have to be able to broker across those. And for us, that's a great story because that is our story, right? What is the biggest <laughs> trend driving your business at Service Mesh right now? Oh my, it's such a massive convergence of so many things right now. I think that cloud has reached maturity. I think people have started to embrace DevOps in general, they're recognizing, I mean, if you if you like go, like there's a Gartner slide somewhere that shows this transition from, you know, transition to a, a cloud operating model. And it starts out in the beginning, I, virtualization, I can get increased the density on my servers and I can get a better ROI. And then you go, okay, well, that doesn't help me spin up applications any faster. Okay, well, now we need to do continuous integration and, and continuous delivery, and then you're like, okay, well, I've done the whole DevOps thing. Then the CIO goes, holy cow, I got all these guys running loose in a muck in, in AWS. I, have I didn't even know I had the risk there. Now I have this <laughs> risk there. So now it becomes, I have to have a, a hybrid cloud. Well, now I have a hybrid cloud. 
uh, you're like, well, I have this cloud and I have this cloud. Well, now it's how do I tie those together so I can really deliver infrastructure as a service to my business, platform as a service to my business, treat my enterprise applications like software as a service, and maintain that service level that people have come to expect from AWS. Right, right. It's, it's a tough position to be a right. CIO right now. I mean, that's, that's And a, that's you a throw, the, throw the, the more rocks on his back is say, <laughs> power and cooling costs are up through the roof. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. power alone is right. killing them. Density yeah. uh, for machines is just, it's just insane. You look at, have you, uh, That's why we're on the, the Columbia River up here in Portland, right? We got all the cheap uh, hydro power up here. Put your data center up here. Have you guys seen <laughs> IO Data? No. So IO Data is this company that they're doing these modular building block. They started out shipping like containers. Now they're doing the whole inside of data centers and they're basically treating them, each of those elements as autonomous units that self-regulate, heating, cooling, spin up, spin down. We've got this project we're working with them. Can, can we actually orchestrate the movement of workloads around based upon energy, heat, cooling, consumption, right? It's, People, it's, it's people, people I want to ask you a question, because this is uh, what people will say about your business in general, just not, not your company, but like yeah. the category. Automation's great, um, but it's the cart before the horse. Um, how do you respond to that? Is that true? Do you not believe it? Is there certain instances? In auto, you have to have the infrastructure first, then automate it. Um, or is there low hanging fruit that you guys can go in and do business with on the automation? I mean, Explain this whole automation yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah, so we fundamentally believe that people are going to have data centers, they're going to have private clouds, they're going to have public clouds. So you have to have that, right? That's the baseline. Like, so if you look at the Gartner model, there's the resources, there's the you know, server, switches, storage, you virtualize those, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You build on that, on top of that. And then you have this, we're above that line. We're not in the business of building clouds, we're in the business of operating and running across clouds and managing those resources. So we would agree with that. Like, yeah, sure, you got to have all that stuff and we're going to increase the efficiency of operation consumption and make it application and business focused. So empower the CIO to time to increase, the, the, reduce the time to value. Right? All right, final questions. We're coming up on the time limit here. Um, future of this business, the cloud, and specifically, what's going to happen with OpenStack? How do you see OpenStack evolving? So one, future cloud, um, how it will evolve in the enterprise and with service providers, obviously you know, creating a modern era of infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, infrastructure as code, whatever you want to call it, and then what do you think about OpenStack's uh, prospects and, and their growth? So I think that the, the world is you know, bifurcating or splitting into maybe more than two, but there's you know, the VMware views of the world and there's the OpenStack, and then Microsoft's actually making an aggressive play that I'm pretty impressed with what they're doing with Azure and System Center, SCOM, et cetera. I think that you really, those become the new cloud operating systems. It no longer becomes about the hypervisor or Hyper-V or, or whatever, right? I think it's about having this cloud-based operating system and I think that OpenStack is effectively the next cloud-based, the open vendor kind of neutral cloud-based operating system and I, I don't see how it cannot be successful. I'm a huge fan. We're working with just about all the players trying to make sure that we can Well, people are bringing code to the table. Yeah, it's huge. And there's massive deployments. There's a lot of deployments. Right. So there's meat on the bone and there's yeah. hype. So it's Look good. Look at PayPal. I mean, you saw the PayPal story. That's huge. Yeah, right? we'd rather cut Silicon Angle cover yeah. that. Yeah. So Marantis, they don't want to talk about it. <laughs> 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 it's kind of like cats out of the <laughs> bag. Guys are killing well, it. Fusion yeah. IO um, was really successful. They had Facebook as a client and Apple, yeah. and they just weren't allowed to talk about it. It was yeah. one of those things where their best deployments we were. We have a lot of those too. Yeah, under the QT. <laughs> um, okay, so so with OpenStack, I see 3,000 people here and growing. They have an event, just a, a spectacular growth. The final, final question is, tell the folks out there, in your opinion, uh, who are looking at OpenStack, maybe been reading about it on Silicon Angle or kicking the tires, who want to dip their toe in the water, who want to maybe join and contribute or participate, um, explain to them what's going on here and how do they do that? I mean, what, what's the best advice you can give them? I think that they just get online and start working with some of the, the thought leaders in the space. I mean, you've got, uh, you know, look at what like Pistons doing. Look, look at what Mirantis is doing. Look at what what uh, op, uh, Rackspace is doing. Piston will be on next. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, those guys are thought leaders. Look at what they're doing. There's real customers using this today. If you're not aware of what's happening, you're behind. Th and the for ball. developers, what's your advice for developers? There's a certain profile. What's in demand right now for developers? I, I think. Well, I mean, there's still there's the classic, you know, whatever code you write. But people who have have are aware of the ability to orchestrate infrastructure via AWS's APIs or via OpenStack's APIs, 
it's, it's a no-brainer. Yeah. If I was a developer, I'd Hey, the service-oriented architecture's coming back. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny. Hey, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey it, took, it took 10 years after the dot-com <laughs> bubble burst before the yeah. web was yeah. actually yeah. functional, as they say. But uh, yeah, we're back We're back to service levels, Everything and is services, service. APIs. Yeah. Uh, Amazon, again, great stuff by Amazon. And I think they've forced the market. Right. And that's uh, exciting to see. And the enterprises are retooling and there's investments. A lot of people are investing in cloud building. Yeah. Question is, you know, what kind of clouds will they build? Yeah, exactly. Okay, Sean Douglas, CTO of Service Mesh here inside the Cube. Exclusive coverage of the this is SiliconANGLE's coverage of the Cube. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. <laughs>